Higher inflation has lifted prices for commodities like crude oil, base metals, natural gas, and others. On today's show, we'll examine ETFs tied to commodities and how to incorporate this underappreciated asset class into your portfolio. Kurt Nelson with Summerhaven Investment Management joins us right after this. Welcome to the program. I'm Laura Cantor with ETF Guide. If you're new to ETF Guide TV, never miss any episodes of First Look ETF or other originals like ETF Battles. Just hit the subscribe button. Also, we encourage you to post your thoughts or questions in the comments section below. More investors and financial professionals are becoming keenly aware of the need to protect their investments from inflation. Here to discuss strategies for doing that is Kurt Nelson, Managing Partner with Summerhaven Investment Management. Kurt, welcome to the program. Hi, Laura. Thank you. So we've seen a massive jump in the prices of everything from raw building materials to natural gas. So give us the big picture view. What's behind the inflationary pressures that are pushing commodities up and does it last? Sure. I mean, we haven't seen inflation in more than a decade, right? This is something that's part of the ecosystem of the American economy. We've had inflation as a component of our economy since the 1930s, 1940s, when we kind of had Bretton Woods and moved off the gold standard. But we've had a decade where inflation has been anemic. We just haven't seen it. It's been below the Fed target of 2% for the last decade. Um, anyone who's paying attention knows that uh, inflation, CPI in particular, has moved a lot higher in the last several months. We went from stories of this is just transitory and it's just going to be a short period of time related to supply disruptions, related to COVID. It was 3%, then it was 4%, 5 6 Last month, we had 7% CPI. I mean, this is not slowed down at all. And in fact, I think Chairman Powell himself said we're going to remove transitory from our vocabulary when we're trying to comment on inflation in the U.S. The House view at Summerhaven is that this is not transitory, that this is now uh, persistent. And there's a, a number of reasons to think that that's going to be the case. One is that we've printed more money in response to COVID and the, you know, the economic uh, um, difficulties over the last two years than we did during the entire global financial crisis of 2010 to 2014. So if, if, as Milton Freeman says, that inflation is a monetary phenomenon, we have printed $5 trillion of new dollars that are now circulating in the economy. We're also seeing a number of other tailwinds that support inflation. We see tighter labor markets. We've seen unemployment go to kind of record lows. We're seeing wage increases, whether it's, you know, uh, salaried employees or part-time workers go up. Another thing that's, I think, uh, sort of under the radar of a number of investors right now is the impact of housing costs and rent equivalents on inflation. So CPI is composed of a number of things, whether it's lumber, copper, um, you know, food costs, et cetera, energy costs. But about 40 to 60 percent of either core or traditional CPI is made up of rent and rent equivalents. Those rents have not gone up sharply. However, we know from the Dallas Fed themselves that those rent movements in price are very closely tied to housing prices. Housing prices have gone up a lot. If you look at the Case Schiller index or look at other housing price indexes, housing prices have gone up a lot in the last 12 to 18 months. And we know that rent goes up about 12 to 18 months after housing costs go up. So any sort of forecast for you know, lower inflation next year, this is all going to kind of um, ameliorate, kind of just dissolve on its own, I think is not well founded. I think that just above and beyond supply chain disruptions that continue, COVID disruptions that continue, tight labor, easy monetary policy, we have on top of all of that, uh, uh, I think a rent uh, um, increase, which is going to be profound and pronounced for the next 12 to 18 months, all of that's going to be a really strong tailwind for inflation. And when you think about how investors are positioned, they're positioned in financial assets largely right now. They're in stocks and bonds, and they're not really well all allocated to traditional real assets, whether it be commodities, uh, natural resource equities, and the like. 
And I think that this is a real important time for investors to reflect on what to expect, not just over the next six months, but over the next decade. Moving on, the race to produce more electric vehicles by global players like Toyota, GM, and Volkswagen is revving up. And that has huge implications for base metals and ETFs linked to it, like the United States Copper Index Fund, ticker CPER. Help us to connect the dots. And copper is just an intrinsic, important commodity uh, for the global economy. There's only a few commodities like copper, silver, and gold that can conduct electricity well. I don't think any of us are expecting our Teslas to be wired with silver or gold unless maybe the Elon Musk personal uh, you know, Tesla that he gets off the shelf. I think that copper is economic and incredibly efficient at conducting electricity. So it's intrinsic in terms of its role in the new economy. The new economy meaning not just electric vehicles, but renewable energy, charging stations, how to transmit the new solar and wind power through an updated grid system. All these are going to be incredibly copper intensive. Um, I think what's interesting about copper is that as, as a global economy over the last 20 to 30 years, we produce just as much copper as we need. So if you look at the amount of copper production and copper consumption each year, they're roughly the same. And for the last four years, we've actually had a slight deficit. So we're producing about 25 million metric tons of copper a year, and we're, we're consuming all of that each year. This is before we have electric vehicles rampant across the United States, across Europe, across Asia, before we build new you know, solar farms, new wind farms, and and update our grid, which is sorely in need of replacement. Um, an additional factor that's just come into play in the last two to three months is a new leader in Chile. So Chile produces about 40% of the world's copper, and they have a new leader who is um, liberal, environmentally oriented, and is not just going to be a pundit for industry. So we know that he's, he's staffed uh, a regional government which has members that are um, both pro-labor, meaning higher wage compensation for you know, the unions and the workers at these mines, as well as pro-environment. So there's gonna be more regulation and, and less sort of, sort of a rubber stamp to new approval of multi-billion dollar mine projects. I think that means that copper supply will continue to grow, but maybe at a slower pace while we're seeing demand grow over the next several years at a much, much higher rate. I think the setup for copper is very interesting. Great point. Let's talk about precious metals for a minute. One common gripe against gold is it pays no income because it has no dividend yield. But now there's a new fund that flips this argument upside down. It's called the USTF Gold Strategy Plus Income Fund, ticker GLDX, and it offers income potential on gold. How does GLDX work? Gold is a terrific asset for a store of wealth. It's been used for centuries, maybe even millennium, for a store of wealth for investors, for savers, to make sure that um, if they're in a fiat currency, whether it's you know euros, dollars, um, Turkish lira, that, that gold is something that will store its value. Um, the and it is very effective at doing so. However. Gold has, physical gold has storage costs and generates no income. So you basically take your cash, whatever currency you have it in, you buy this yellow metal and you store it in a vault and you pay storage fees. Um, as a portfolio manager uh, for this fund, what Summerhaven is trying to do is to generate income along with the basic long-term storage potential of gold for wealth preservation. So the way we're doing that is by buying commodity futures, buying gold futures, which are traded on the, the COMEX exchange, and then selling covered call options. So uh, equity investors are probably very familiar with this. It's called a covered call strategy or a buy right strategy. And so what Summerhaven is trying to do is to sell short dated out of the money call options each month, which generate premium income. And that income creates uh, basically distributable, distributable dividends for a fund investor on a, on a quarterly basis. So we're taking something which is a long-term uh, store of value that investors have recognized for, for hundreds or thousands of years and turn it into something that has the potential to create income in portfolios today. One final question before you take off. 
Investors looking to add diversified exposure to commodities may want to check out the USCF Summer Haven Dynamic Commodity Strategy No K1 Fund, ticker SDCI. How do you see investors using SDCI? So the Summer Haven Dynamic Commodity Index is unusual in that it's providing long-only commodity exposure across a wide swath of commodities, roughly 27 that we track each month. However, we, the index targets those that are in the lowest inventory or in the most scarce state at any point in time, because that seems to drive the compensation or risk premium within commodity futures. So uh, case in point, we're all familiar that oil has gone up a lot. We've seen unleaded gasoline, WTI or Brent oil prices go up quite a bit during 2021. But the best performing commodity last year was actually tin. It was up more than 100 percent. It beat energy products by more than 40 percent over the year. Tin is one of the metals that we use in our index. And each month we're targeting 14, basically half of that universe of 27, and trying to identify those that are in a low inventory state and allocate equally across those. So by use of things like tin or softs like cotton or coffee, we're able to identify markets that are perhaps less represented in traditional indexes like the Bloomberg Commodity Index or the GSCI Index and target return potential through scarcity and manage risk through equal weighting. Well, thank you, Kurt. We appreciate your insights and we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you, Laura. To learn more about investing in commodities and ETF lineup using Summer Haven indexes, go to uscfinvestments.com. The link is posted in the description section below.